AP Biology, Second Quarter Review, Part 4. An overview of cell respiration. So we have a couple of processes going on here. And remember that um, anaerobic means without oxygen. And means without, aerobic means oxygen. And only one process does not require oxygen. Whether it's there or, pres whether it's there or not, you're going to be able to do glycolysis. And by the way, if you don't have a mitochondria, if you're a bacteria, then that's all you're going to be able to do is glycolysis. This happens in the cytosol, the cytoplasm, outside the mitochondria. And again, if you're a bacteria, that's all you have is a cytoplasm. You don't have uh, membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen. And the parts that require oxidation are the uh, oxidation uh, pyruvate, which is kind of like a half-step between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain all require oxygen. So if you don't get oxygen, you don't have the mitochondria work at all. And that includes no Krebs cycle and no electron transport chain only glycolysis. The mitochondria, once again, has a double membrane. We talked about that earlier. Uh, one thing you should know is that the cristae have lots of folds for increasing surface area to allow more of those carrier proteins, electron transport chain, to make more ATP. Lots of places to carry out those chemical reactions. It's an example of the relationship between structure and function. All right, this is a good one to have memorized, this diagram here. We have the three parts of cell respiration, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain. The first part is glycolysis. Glyco means sugar. Lysis means break apart. This is the part where we break apart sugar, c 6 6 Now, remember, the glucose has stored energy in there, made by photosynthesis. And that glucose is going to be ripped apart for its energy. Most of its energy is going to end up in NADH and FADH2. However, some of the energy is going to be make a small amount of ATP. So the first step in glycolysis is to rip off some of those high energy electrons from the hydrogens of glucose and transfer them to NAD plus to make NADH. When that NAD uh, accepts two electrons and two protons, that's called reduction. And NADH is reduced and has energy to transfer to the last step called electron transport. So we're ripping off some of those electrons from the sugar, and then we're going to break it in part using some of its energy to make ATP by a process called substrate level phosphorylation, basically getting our phosphate from a substrate that the enzymes would act on and adding it to ADP to make ATP. At the end of glycolysis, this is all catalyzed by enzymes, proteins. We're going to have two pyruvate. Think of a pyruvate as a sugar broken in two with some of its electrons missing, some of its energy gone as well. Those two pyruvate are going to enter the next step called the Krebs cycle. Now there's a little half step here where we convert the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and we can make some ATP in this process and carbon dioxide. Um, however, the Krebs cycle is the important next step. The Krebs cycle is going to take that now broken down sugar a little bit uh, and rip off more electrons, more high energy electrons. We're going to harvest the energy from that glucose molecule and transfer the electrons to NAD to make NADH, six NADHs, and a new electron transporter called FADH2. We're going to make two of those FADH2s. So for each pyruvate, we make three NADHs and one FADH2 for a total of two pyruvate, making six NADHs and two FADH2s. If you hear the word FADH2, there's only one place we make that, and that's the Krebs cycle. Now, by the time we're done with the uh, enzymes of the Krebs cycle, we've busted apart that sugar completely. We've taken out the electrons that had energy on it, transported it to the electron transporters of NADH and FADH2, and all that's left now is the waste gas, carbon dioxide. It's going to diffuse out of the membranes of the mitochondria into the bloodstream and eventually diffuse into your lungs to breathe out. When you're breathing out carbon dioxide, that's where it's coming from, the Krebs cycle of the mitochondria. In the process of the Krebs cycle, enzymatically controlled uh, reactions, we have another couple of ATP being made, also by substrate level phosphorylation. The reason why it's called a cycle is that some of the, um, uh, the, the molecules in the cycle are recycled again over and over again, regenerated, that we'll talk about later. The last step of the electron transport chain is called or the last step is called the electron transport chain. This is going to be making ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to be using oxygen uh, as the final electron acceptor to help drive the process of making ATP. Uh, and we're going to make a lot of ATP, 34 of it, by oxidative phosphorylation. Make sure you have this diagram memorized. 
For each glucose molecule, we make a total of 30 ATP. Now remember, we made six carbon dioxide molecules, right? So why did why six? Well, we had a starting glucose molecule of C6H12O6. That's where those six carbons end up in the carbon dioxide gas given off by the mitochondria. So we're going to skip right to the, the last step here, and this is the electron transport chain. Uh, the electron transport chain is, um, is a bunch of proteins embedded within the inner membrane. And you can see the diagram here, it's an expanded view. The dark orange represents the inner membrane space. The light orange represents the matrix inside the mitochondria. Now don't get con this confused with the, the chloroplast in photosynthesis. They have different names, but there are some similarities, and the electron transport chain is one of them. NADH and FADH2, not shown, are going to drop off their electrons, and the protons are just going to be used in the, the matrix for pumping. So when that NADH loses its electron and this carrier molecule grabs it, that's called a redox reaction. NADH becomes oxidized and the carrier proteins become reduced. That reduced energy means stored energy, and that energy is going to be used to change the shape of this protein to do some active transport. We're going to be pumping from low in the matrix, low concentration of hydrogen ions to high concentration in the inner membrane space, using the energy from electrons that we ultimately got from sugar. The electrons are going to be passed along these carrier molecules from protein to protein, using its energy to pump protons into the inner membrane space. And the reason why they're being pulled along here is because they're attracted to a very electronegative element, and that element is oxygen. This is the reason why you're breathing right now. The oxygen is the final electron acceptor that's very electronegative, that's pulling the electrons toward it in this process. With no oxygen, you don't pull the electrons, uh, everything backs up, and you don't pump any more protons in the space, and basically the whole system's gonna shut down because everything's gonna get backed up. And that's why you need to breathe oxygen, is to keep those electrons flowing. So the electrons are being used, losing energy, as they're being transferred from carrier protein to carrier protein to pump protons into this space in between the membranes. The electron eventually ends up being accepted by oxygen. A proton follows. One electron, one proton is going to make ourselves some water. So the end destination that the electron uh, finally ends up at is uh, in water that your body can use. About 10% of the body's needs are made uh, by the water molecules of cell respiration. So electrons started in glucose, ended up in water. So now we've generated a huge proton gradient. By the way, there's no le sugar left. All we did was use the energy to pump the protons, but the sugar itself has been, you know, lost its carbon dioxide gas and the electrons end up in water. So the sugar itself doesn't get used to make ATP, but the energy was used to pump these protons into the space. Now that we have all this concentrated protons in this intermembrane space called a concentration gradient, they can diffuse. It's kind of like water behind a dam. You have it stored up here. That's the little space in here called the intermembrane space. Now these protons can diffuse through this uh, channel, this protein channel, for this enzyme called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is an enzyme that makes, as the name implies, ATP. Remember that anything with an ACE ending is an enzyme. Using the energy flowing from high to low concentration for these hydrogen ions, we're going to use that energy to add a phosphate to ADP, to make ATP. So we're phosphorylating ADP to make ATP. Since oxygen was involved in this process a little bit earlier, that's called oxidative phosphorylation. And we're going to make a whole bunch of ATP by this, 34 total for, for glucose. Now remember that we have a special word for the flow of protons, also called hydrogen ions, through from high to low concentration, and that's called chemiosmosis. It's kind of a confusing name. Osmosis sounds like water flowing. Chemiosmosis just refers to hydrogen ions. And uh, we have a similar setup in the thylakoid membranes in the photosynthesis. So once that uh, hydrogen ion flows through uh, ATP synthase, we make a whole bunch of ATP, hydrogen ions can then be repumped into the inner membrane space. And that is the electron transport chain. Pyruvate is the branching point. And um, remember, pyruvate's made at the end of glycolysis. And if you have oxygen, we're going to do all the fun stuff in the mitochondria. We're going to do the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, making lots of ATP. But what if you don't have oxygen? Everything gets backed up as far as uh, the electrons have no place to go, so they just kind of hang out on the carrier proteins. And uh, eventually, you use up all your NAD and FAD to make NADH and FADH2. 
they can't lose their electrons, so they just stay as NADH and FADH2, and um, you can't regenerate your NAD. So what ends up happening is, with no oxygen, you go through a fermentation pathway, and that does not require oxygen. In fact, it only happens without oxygen. If there's no oxygen, that pyruvate gets turned into something called ethanol in plants and lactate in us animals. Now, if you ever experienced the big muscle burn during intense exercise, you're probably not getting enough ex oxygen, and you're going into anaerobic respiration only in the process of fermentation. Now, here's a key idea. In order to um, do fermentation, the reason why we're doing fermentation is because you need some NAD in order to do glycolysis. When you run out of NAD, there's no more glycolysis happening. So what really is happening here in fermentation is the pyruvate is taking uh, H from NADH to regenerate NAD. Now you have this in your notes, but uh, once you have your NAD, you can do a little more glycolysis, make two ATP, and you can make some ATP with no oxygen. Now, can you survive with just two, uh, two ATP? The answer is no, but um, you do make some, and some is better than none. So once again, fermentation is about regenerating NAD, so you can do more glycolysis to make ATP, and in the process, in plants producing drinking alcohol called ethanol, and in animals, lactate or lactic acid. Evolutionary perspective, life on Earth first evolved without free oxygen. And the reason why we know this is that the oldest layers of rock on this planet have no rust, no oxidized iron. It uh, only oxidizes in the presence of oxygen. That's why red rocks is ro uh, red, is because of the, the rust in the rocks. And that's what geologists study. That's where geology supports biology. Organisms that evolved glycolysis are the ancestor to all modern life. So glycolysis is a common process to all living things. And basically the mitochondria builds on a earlier evolutionary process of glycolysis. And yes, you are related to bacteria, albeit very, very distantly. In about over almost two billion years. All right, so what happens to that oxygen, that, or the carbon dioxide that you produce in your cells? It gets transported to your bloodstream, diffuses from high to low concentration into your lungs, and then you squeeze those lungs and you breathe out the carbon dioxide. And now you know why you breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. So how are photosynthesis and cell respiration connected? Well, in heterotrophs, we only do cell respiration. So we're breaking down glucose using oxygen to produce carbon dioxide as a waste product, water, and ATP. Autotrophs are able to do both cell respiration and photosynthesis. And what the autotrophs do in photosynthesis is take that carbon dioxide, take water, using light energy to make sugars, make oxygen. So think of them as almost like reverse processes. Cell respiration, taking stored energy, making a more usable form of chemical energy, autotrophs, plants, and other proteins will take light energy and store it as chemical potential energy within sugars. Photosynthesis happens in plants, proteins like algae and blue-green algae, which are basically a bacteria. Uh, even though they don't have membrane bargnels, they actually are almost like a, a chloroplast themselves. Cell respiration is all eukaryotes. Uh, everything that's a eukaryote pretty much has a mitochondria, with a few exceptions. And uh, that includes plants. Don't forget plants have their mitochondria too. So we can describe this as a cycle. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water using sun, making glucose and oxygen. And then glucose and oxygen is used in cell respiration to make ATP, carbon dioxide and water. So what does it mean to be a plant? Well, you're collecting light energy, transforming it to stored energy between the bonds of atoms, called uh, chemical energy. We're going to store it for a rainy day. We can't store the light. And we're going to use it for building blocks, for uh, 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 making some of the organic molecules within the plant. The carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, especially those carbohydrates, all those sugars and starches, they're going to be made from photosynthesis. And if you remember, the cell walls of plants are made out of sugars. And where those sugars come from? Photosynthesis. So they basically put them cells together using light, carbon dioxide, and water, which is kind of incredible if you think about it. So what's a leaf? Well, we got a leaf cross-section here. The outer shiny surface that prevents water loss is called a cuticle. It's waxy. It's a type of lipid. 
We have the next layer called the epidermis, kind of the skin of the plant. The middle layer is called the mesophyll, and this is the area where most of the chloroplasts are found, and this is what uh, is doing most of the photosynthesis. These bottom holes here are called stomates, and they allow gas exchange. This ends part four of your second quarter review.